How is the Grumman Tiger, a suburban airport, and the Bell 47 helicopter all related? It's an amazing story, and one of four amazing stories and coincidences that we're bringing to you in a special episode of Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. We're also acknowledging the fact that the channel has reached 15,000 subscribers. And I want to just take a quick moment to say thank you for all the folks who supported the channel. We really appreciate having you on board. And I find it amazing that a person of my generation can share aviation history with a global audience on a social media platform uh, and have uh, so many wonderful comments. And it's just been a really uh, just sensational, very enjoyable experience. And thank you again. Well, we're going to begin uh, our program with some slogans. This one goes back to the Wright brothers. If God meant for man to fly, he'd have given him wings. Or this one from today, there's plenty of money in aviation. I put most of mine there. And then certain aviation phenomena simply can't be explained. And I'm going to share four stories that show you this. The first begins with Captain Eddie Rickenbacker announcing a new concept in air transportation, the introduction of the Douglas DC-7B Golden Falcon for Eastern Airlines. If you've uh, been on the channel, you know that my story of uh, my father's trip to Miami, Florida in July of 1956, where he brought home a lithograph by a Douglas artist named George Akimoto and a certificate signed by the entire crew really became the catalyst and the inspiration for my career as a Douglas artist. It was my dream job, 11 years, uh, seven in-house, uh, four uh, as a freelance uh, artist. But uh, God, it was like working at Disneyland and it was just one of the greatest experiences of my life. But on that trip, dad had taken uh, two photos of the airplane uh, while he was uh, climbing the boarding stairs. Uh, the first looking forward, and you can see this is a factory fresh brand new machine. There isn't a speck of oil on the wing or the engine. And then he turned and took a picture of the tail. Uh, and you can see the registration number up there, November 801 Delta, the first of 25 new DC-7Bs for Eastern Airlines. Well, years uh, later uh, on a project for Douglas, I had a, uh, a DC-7 a heritage historical uh, uh, project to write for a, a, a company newspaper. And I was looking through the photo archives, uh, which were arranged by airline. So I looked up DC-7 and Eastern and found this shot of a DC-7B brand new rolling out of the final assembly building at Douglas's Santa Monica, California factory. A few photos later, I discovered that airplane was 801 Delta, the very machine that my dad had flown, which started my career. What were the chances of that happening? The second story involves Zahn's Airport in Amityville, Long Island. Again, if you've been on the channel, you know that I've uh, shown you this Aurora Aero Commander uh, kit cover uh, by Mort Kunstler. And for all you modelers out there, a special shout out to Max's Models and all the great glue troopers. Uh, you're familiar with the story of uh, my working as a line boy out there. Uh, I actually drove that gas truck. I climbed that uh, wooden step ladder and the airplane right in the foreground, the green and black uh, Aero Commander 560 was used by a gentleman who had a flying ambulance service. And I refueled that airplane many times. But my baby, the, my favorite airplane of the fleet was a 1965 Piper Cherokee C8496 Whiskey. Loved flying this airplane. Gosh, what a just a great experience. One of my instructors at Zahn's was a rising star, young man named Ernie Arena. And uh, I flew with Ernie a number of times. And uh, this is a page from my logbook. We did a, a dual cross country uh, in a Piper Comanche 260. It was kind of a neat day. Now, this is my friend, Craig Cadera. Craig, uh, Craig and I knew each other for 43 years. Sadly, he uh, passed away last year. But uh, Craig was a pilot in the uh, Air Force and one heck of an aviation artist. Yes, this is a painting. Craig's dream from the time he was a kid was to fly as a pilot for American Airlines. And that wish came true. He rose to seniority number one 
first officer on the DC-9 Super 80 for American uh, out of Los Angeles. And uh, after he retired, he moved from California to Florida and settled in a little town called Claremont, north of Orlando. And one day he called me up and he said, hey, I just met my next door neighbor. The guy has a Corvette and he was a pilot. He just retired from the FAA and he was an instructor. He lived in New York. He worked at a little airport out there. And his name was Ernie Arena. What are the chances of that? Our next story involves my sailplane. Uh, this is the first of two Blonics that I owned. Uh, Thelma Lou was the uh, name of this airplane, and that's kind of a long story. We'll save for another time. But uh, that airplane was based at Skylark Field in uh, Elsinore, California. And uh, the gentleman you see on the left is my dear friend and partner in crime, Rick Johnson. Rick and I were the commercial pilots for the flight school, and our job was to give glider rides to the folks that came out there and share the joy of uh, motorless flight uh, and uh, just uh, show everyone how, how what a beautiful experience it was. Uh, my favorite part of that was uh, giving a ride to someone who was so excited that they signed up for lessons and became pilots themselves. In many of our discussions, Rick and I talked about the airplanes that were very important to us in our uh, formative years. Of course, I talked about my Cherokee 180 and a Twin Beach, uh, the only time I ever cut school to go flying. And Rick talked about his favorite Cessna 150 that he flew at his hometown in St. Tralee, Illinois, and uh, an airplane that was owned by his father-in-law, a Beechcraft Staggerwing. He never got to see the airplane, but he talked about it in mystical terms. It was such a classic, beautiful flying machine. Well, Rick and I had a, a side gig, as it were. Uh, Rick and I were the uh, delivery pilots or ferry pilots for an outfit called Aerosport a distributor for foreign sailplanes, including the Blahnik. Aerosport was owned and operated by Captain Phil Paul, a Flying Tigers DC-8 pilot at that time, and electronics wizard, Charlie Genish. Charlie and Phil were uh, exceptional airmen, two of the most talented pilots I've ever had the privilege of flying with. And it was really uh, quite an experience working for them. Well, Charlie and Phil had developed a uh, cross-country aero tow method to deliver these airplanes all over the western United States. And uh, we were using Phil's uh, Bonanza V35B uh, on a high altitude uh, extended cross-country aero tow. Uh, the way this would work is we would uh, climb to uh, 10,000 feet once we were clear of controlled airspace in LA and then accelerate from our tow speed of 70 knots up to 100 knots and maintain this for the uh, cruise leg of each trip. Our longest flight was from Long Beach to Eugene, Oregon with an overnight. And uh, here we are passing Mount Shasta. We delivered the glider uh, the next morning. And then on the way home, uh, we stopped for lunch at a little airport north of Lake Tahoe called Truckee. The restaurant was closed that day, but we spent some time uh, stretching our legs and walking around the airport and I found this beautiful MS-760 uh, Paris jet. And then there was a long line of tea hangers and Rick and I walked down to the end, there was an open door at the very end. And inside that open door was a Beechcraft Staggerwing, the first one Rick had ever seen. What were the chances of that? And our last story took place on Monday, October 12th, 1957 at the Columbus Day Air Show. This was held at Long Island MacArthur Airport in Islip, New York. Today, MacArthur looks uh, like this. It's a bustling commercial airport out in uh, Suffolk County on the eastern end of Long Island. But in 1954, uh, they built the first terminal building. Uh, it had been a World War II training base, actually. And you see the new hangar going up in the background. And this is what the airport looked like uh, back in the mid-1950s. Uh, on top of the terminal building, about a year after this photo was taken, they built an observation deck with kind of a rickety old wood staircase, and you could go up there and watch all the planes. Well, on the day of the air show, uh, my father and I went up there, and he took uh, this photo. Uh, the airplanes had flown in from a number of different places. These were all from Mitchell Field, Mitchell Air Force Base in Garden City, Long Island, the current home of the Cradle of Aviation Museum. And... Uh, my dad had brought the camera, and so we spent uh, some time walking around on the ramp, and we took pictures of the C-47. 
the C-119 flying boxcar, uh, the T-33 jet trainer. United had flown a DC-6B into the uh, air show, and you could take tours walking through the airliner. That was pretty cool. And then Grumman flew uh, three airplanes in from nearby Beth Page, uh, and this is the uh, two-seat uh, Cougar, the F9F8T. And the coolest looking jet at the air show, the F11F1 Tiger. And the third airplane was an S2F Tracker, factory fresh. And I should mention, this is the first time I'd ever seen real airplanes close up. I was 10 years old, and this was just a momentous occasion. You see a Helio Courier off on the right and a glider in the background. Well, at this point, my dad said, all right, we've seen all the airplanes. What would you want? What would you like to do? And I said, I'd like to go back over to the Grumman Tiger. They have a sign on the nose gear, and I'd like to see what the top speed of that jet is. About that same time, a gentleman named Ray Newbeck was taking a picture of his seven-year-old son, Ken, seen here, standing next to the F-11. But if we widen out the photo, there's a kid and his father walking over to the airplane. And believe it or not, that's me. What were the odds of a photo like this being taken? Ken and I later met uh, through our connection with Republic. Uh, Ken had worked for Fairchild Republic. Of course, my uncle worked there, and so we became friends. And when he sent this picture, I, I can't even find the words to describe it. I lost my dad four years after this photo was taken, and it had a meaning to me that, uh, again, I can't even describe. And then dad said, you get one ride in anything you want. My father was in real estate. He worked in nearby Lake Ronkonkoma, and he left me at the air show that day, gave me some money for lunch, and said, I'll be back at four o'clock. Uh, you get one ride, pick anything you want, and I'll meet you over here at the fence and uh, have fun. Well, wow, tough choice. They had a Cessna 310, just like Sky King. They had a glider. They had all sorts of Cessnas and Pipers. The 99's Women uh, Pilot Organization was giving rides for a penny a pound. And they had a Bell 47 helicopter, just like on the TV show Whirly Birds. And yes, I have a Swedar Bell 47 model just like that. Mine has pontoons. But I wanted to be that kid. And my wish came true. I got my first flight in a Bell 47 G2 with the doors off. It was so loud, probably uh, partly responsible for my hearing loss today, but God, it was loud. It, it, was, it shook itself. I, I thought it was going to shake itself to pieces. The vibration was just incredible. And I loved every second of it. And we were up for about 15 minutes and it was just spectacular. But who says lightning can't strike twice in the same spot? The picture of uh, the Bell 47 here shows the the, the name Whirlybird written in red letters on the side. And Ray Newbeck took another photo of his son, Ken. Guess what's in the background? You see the name Whirlybird on the back there. Well, I fell in love with helicopters. I started lessons the very next week. Here's my first solo in a clothesline 2000. This is a home build. Landed that thing right next to the tree. Pretty tricky. Did a lot of flying with New York Airways and the uh, Boeing Vertol 107s around the New York area. And then recently, as a volunteer air crew member with the L.A. County Sheriff Aero Bureau, flying in the Eurocopter AS350B2 A-Star. This is the actual helicopter that I flew in at the air show at MacArthur. It was owned by Island Helicopters. And as Colombo used to say, just one more thing. Where do you think Island Helicopters was based? You guessed it, Zahn's Airport. Well, there you have it. Four stories of some of the amazing coincidences that happen in aviation. As always, special thanks to the great folks who made this uh, presentation possible. The late Ray Newbeck and his son, Ken, my dear friend, Rick Johnson, Mr. Phil Paul and Charlie Ganish of Aerosport, and the late Andy Bonim, who took the black and white photos of Zahn's airport. Thank you for celebrating aviation with Mike Machat. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. And until next time, take care.